All right. We're moving right along and starting the nervous system now. This is a little bit of a longer system, a um, lot more topics to cover in the nervous system. We could spend a whole semester, actually, in the nervous system because there's just so many branches of it. So we're going to start with just the basics of the nervous system, nervous tissue, and looking at what makes it special. When we studied the tissues in Chapter 4, you'll remember we talked about the unique function of nervous tissue is that it can conduct electrical signals. So those electrical signals are actually ions, charged ions, moving across a cell membrane. And remember, charged ions are water-soluble, which means they can't just diffuse across a membrane like oxygen and carbon dioxide can, but they need a channel to get through. So we're going to talk a lot about protein channels and ions as we talk about changes in the charge difference across a membrane, which is generating an, an electrical signal. So in the nervous system, we have the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, which is outlined in green here. And the peripheral nervous system is, are all the nerves that branch off of the brain and spinal cord. So there's, there's nerves that branch off of the brain, such as the olfactory nerve for smell. It runs through the cribriform plate, remember? Um, those branch right off the brain, but there's still nerves, a part of the peripheral nervous system. And the optic nerve extends from the back of your eyeball and descends down to the back of your brain for vision to the occipital lobe of the brain. So those are examples of, of nerves coming off the brain. And then we have all the nerves that come off of, this, of the spinal cord, and that's what controls your arms and legs and muscle movements and everything else. So we're going to talk about both systems and how they work together to, again, conduct electrical signals and keep the body in homeostasis. So looking at the organs of the nervous system, we have the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves, and the sensory receptors, which are part of a nerve. It's the ending of a nerve, or you could call it the starting, depending on where, what your reference frame is. But um, sensory receptors, like in the, in the optic nerve, detect light. So those sensory receptors are in the back of our eyeball on the retina, and they detect light and send it on its way to the brain for processing. <clears throat> Uh, responsibilities or major functions of the nervous system, um, sensation. So we can sense temperature, pain, sound, right, touch, sight, taste, smell, all of those different sensations. Mental activities, thinking, remembering, our emotions, language, stimulating, stimulating muscles to move. If you want to scratch your head, you consciously make the effort to lift your arm up and scratch your head and secretions of many glands. So some of those um, activities are subconscious. It's controlled by the endocrine system or the autonomic nervous system, and you don't have to think about it, but there's still activity going on. So again, subdivisions, we have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, and we'll spend a lot of time looking at both. When we look at the central nervous system, the components, like I said, are the brain and spinal cord. And the peripheral nervous system are the spinal nerves coming off of the spinal cord. So we can see these here, shown in yellow. I'll make this a little bigger. And then the brain, see the little yellow nerves coming off of the brain? Those are the cranial nerves. You'll spend a lot of time, if you have to take advanced A&P, knowing the names of all the cranial nerves and their functions and some characteristics about them. So, and you'll even test their function in lab. So those are the cranial nerves, all part of the peripheral nervous system. And there are certain diseases that are unique to the central nervous system and others that are unique to the peripheral nervous system. For example, multiple sclerosis is a disease of the central nervous system. And it affects um, nervous tissue in the brain and spinal cord. Guillain-Barre syndrome, have you ever heard of that? Sometimes you have to sign that sheet when you get your flu shot. And they'll ask you, have you ever had Guillain-Barre? It's spelt kind of, it's a French word. It's like G-U-I-L-L. IAN, that, that condition. That's a, a very similar disease to multiple sclerosis affecting um, nerve conduction, but that is in the peripheral nervous system. So different diseases affecting different tissue. So the central nervous system, you can kind of think of it as the processing center. So the central nervous system is where integration occurs. We have information coming in from 
the peripheral nervous system, so the in from, you know, coming from the outside in, we call that sensory information coming into the brain and spinal cord. So there's a, a neuron, a special nerve cell that receives the information. These would be sensory receptors here, bringing the information in to the brain and spinal cord for processing. And the brain and spinal cord decide, brain or spinal cord decides what we're going to do with that information. And then a response is generated through a different nerve. So this is called the motor output pathway or the motor neuron. So the cells of the nervous system are called neurons. We have a sensory neurons bringing information out. And then we have neurons within the brain that are working to process. And then the motor neuron sends it out. For example, seeing a drink of water, sending the information in, the brain decides, yeah, I'm thirsty. So you stimulate the muscle to grab onto that glass of water and take a drink. So sensory pathway, motor pathway, just know the direction. Sensory is incoming, motor is outgoing. And it's just a, a pathway for that electrical impulse to travel. So if we put it all together, this is in your textbook, this nice diagram that just kind of summarizes everything. We have the, sensor, or the central nervous system made up of the brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system that are communicating back and forth. Blue is incoming, red is outgoing. So sensory information is coming in from the peripheral nervous system. Then information is going back out to the peripheral nervous system. And then we have two different divisions of these nerves that are coming and going. The sensory division is incoming. The motor division is outgoing. I already talked about that. But the motor response can be two different things. It could be voluntary motor response. So we call that the somatic nervous system. If I'm using my muscle to voluntarily navigate my environment, that's a somatic that we call the neurons that are controlling that voluntary movement. We call that the somatic neurons, this, or the division of the somatic nervous system. Autonomic, think of it as automatic. You don't have to think about it. The autonomic nervous system is controlling those things we don't want to worry about, like when we need to increase our rate of breathing or increase our heart rate or decrease our blood pressure, increase our blood pressure, secrete um, some insulin from our pancreas. We don't need to consciously think about those things. They just happen automatically. So think of auto as kind of self-regulated. We don't have to worry about it, right? So like an automobile, you turn it on, there's an engine and gas, it goes. It doesn't need a horse to pull it, right? It's self-propelled. So same with this. Autonomic is automatic. So think of smooth muscle, so digesting your food, sending urine from your kidney down to your bladder. That's smooth muscle contraction that's delivering those substances. Same thing with moving blood through your blood vessels, smooth muscle contractions. We don't have to worry about that. Cardiac muscle, same thing. We don't have to think about contracting our heart. So smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and gland secretion is all autonomic. We don't have to think about it. So that's a motor response. It's, it's causing some effect in the body to keep us at homeostasis. So the nervous system is really essential for homeostasis. So again, two branches of the motor division, somatic voluntary movement, autonomic is automatic, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, gland activity. Now if you look at the autonomic, it's further divided into two more divisions sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic means you're revving the body up for fight or flight with your smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and gland activity. So for cardiac muscle, if, you're, if I'm preparing the body for, for activity, putting the gas on, I would want to increase my heart rate, right? But if the brain stimulates the parasympathetic division, we're doing the opposite. We're slowing the body down for rest and digest activities. For example, if, if the decision in the body is we're in a relaxed state, we want to digest our sandwich, which division are we going to kick in of the autonomic nervous system? The parasympathetic. It's the rest and digest division. So then all the glands and smooth muscle activity related to rest and digest are active when the parasympathetic nervous system is dominating and being stimulated by the central nervous system.
But then again, if I just told you you're going to come up here and give a speech on the rest of the notes for today, which system might kick in for some of you? The sympathetic. So what would happen to the, the glands for salivation and digestion? How do people feel when they're giving a speech as far as their mouth? Feels pretty dry, right? So we have low activity of salivary glands in the sympathetic nervous system. What's the heart rate doing when we're stressed out? Increased. How about smooth muscle contraction? How does digestion feel when you're stressed out? What? Slow, slow digestion. Start to feel nauseous. Because when digestion is not moving things through, it makes us feel nauseous. That's why we listen to bowel sounds in patients that are coming out of surgery. Because sometimes they think they're hungry because they haven't eaten all day because they weren't allowed to eat before surgery. So they wake up and say, I want to get a burger and fries. But if there's bowels in their stomach, that smooth muscle hasn't woken up from the anesthesia, they're going to throw that food right back up again. So you think you're being friendly by saying, sure, go ahead and order. But if we don't hear good bowel sounds, they're not going to be able to digest it. So parasympathetic is slow rest and digest activities, sympathetic is speeding up activities. Again, they're all automatic, all part of the motor division. But if I'm throwing, so I'll give you a couple examples now. I'm throwing a football to a friend. What system in this chart, what, what system is activating? Throwing a football. Everybody write it down on a piece of paper. I want you to think about it. You have to commit. One of these boxes is what we're focusing on. And we're focusing on the motor response or the sensory, and then one of these four. If you're thinking motor, if it's a response, because if, if I'm doing something, that's a motor response, right? So you would say that's motor, and then which division of motor would it be specifically? Going a football, what division? Somatic, yep, it's the somatic division because it's voluntary. I can voluntarily throw a football, maybe not correctly, but you can try anyway, right? Okay, how about if I hear a noise in the hallway? What square am I in if I hear a noise in the hallway? Write it down and oh, tell a friend. Just hearing. Mm -hmm. just hearing. Nope, just hearing a noise in the hallway. What what division are we in? So if we were hearing something, that would be the sensory division. And if we're doing something and feeling like we're resting and digesting, that's parasympathetic. If we're doing something that's revving us up, that's the sympathetic nervous system. We'll talk more about each of those divisions a little later. So let's talk about the boss of the central nervous system, and that is the neuron. It's the basic unit of structure and function in the nervous system. And what that means is that nervous tissue is made up of neurons, so that's why we say it's the structure, the basic unit of structure. It's made up of neurons. And the major function is to conduct electrical signals. So this is the cell that conducts the electrical signals. This is what it looks like. So this is very different than the cell model we looked, like, looked at in lab. That was a columnar cell from the digestive system. So this is a, a neuron. This is a nerve cell. And it has a different little appearance. But it has the basics that we said all cells have. It has a nucleus. It has a cell membrane. So this yellow outer covering is all cell membrane. So that's a plasma membrane that's only permeable to lipid-soluble substances. Anything that's water-soluble, if it wants to cross into these portions of the cell, they have to have a carrier. And it has cytoplasm. So a lot of the cytoplasm is in the cell body. This is the portion where the nucleus is. So we call this the cell body or the soma. This is the integrating part. This is where the decisions are made for this nerve cell, whether we want to conduct an impulse along or not. So the cell body is the large part. These little pieces coming off of the cell body, these extensions, they kind of act like antenna to receive signals from the outside, either from another nerve cell or from a, maybe these are modified to become sensory receptors. But these are called dendrites. These are the receiving parts of the neuron. They receive information in via the dendrites. So it's processed by the cell body. And if there's enough 
flow of ions to generate an electrical signal. This special widened portion of the neuron here is called the axon hillock. That's where a special neuron, uh, neural signal called an action potential is generated, and that travels away from the cell body down the axon. So the axon is the highway for an impulse to travel down to the end, which are called axon terminals. Just like an airport terminal is where you go to hook up with your, air, air, your flight. So we have dendrites that receive information, so arrows are coming in. Then it's processed by the cell body. Then it's um, sent to the axon hillock. Well, we have enough ion flow, I should say. Then at the level of the axon hillock, we have a lot of channels for sodium and potassium to generate an action potential traveling down the axon <laughs> to the axon terminals. And what we find in the axon terminals are little vesicles of neurotransmitters that will be released only if an action potential comes down the axon, which again depends on what's going on here in the cell body and dendrites. Then that'll be released and this little axon, these axon terminals will stimulate either a muscle, a gland, or some other organ to respond, to do a motor response. Or there might be another neuron here. It might be a pathway going from the sensory pathway down to the, out to the motor pathway. It just depends on, you know, where this neuron is, and we'll talk about that. And then notice that some neurons, many neurons, especially in the peripheral nervous system, have a special insulating covering called the myelin sheath. So the blue here is myelin. And we only see myelin on the axon, because we want to insulate the axon to keep things on the highway and not have those electrical signals going off the axon so that it's not traveling along its path. So we want to keep it on the path, on the axon, with these myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath is produced by little cells that wrap around a section of the axon, and they're called Schwann cells. So a Schwann cell is, think of like a, if you have a hot dog as the axon, the Schwann cell makes the hot dog bun around the axon. So the Schwann cell wraps around the axon and secretes myelin underneath it to make this nice fatty outer covering. And if, it's a, if the axon is myelinated, the conduction is really fast and uninterrupted down the axon. So when we need quick, fast, responsive movements to protect us, like our reflexes, those are heavy myelinated axons to make sure that impulse travels where it needs to go and the motor response is quick, quick and efficient. In diseases like Guillain-Barre and multiple sclerosis, the Schwann cell, the myelin is damaged, and it's, there's different causes and different cells involved, but the myelin is damaged, and then the impulse is not uh, transmitted like it should, and it leads to you know, weakness, um, so in some cases pain, and a lot of other problems. But we'll get, you'll get into that more when you get into your different programs, especially if you're going into nursing. So those are the parts of the neuron. The little breaks in myelin, myelin is where the uh, signal can flow. So it jumps over the insulated areas, and that's what allows the signal to go faster. These little breaks in myelin are called nodes of Ranvier. The R it has kind of a French sound to it. So it's nodes of Ranvier where the impulse jumps from node to node to node. Those are bare spots on the axon. So those are all described there. So again, myelinated axons have really quick transmission. They have those little breaks in the myelin called nodes of Ranvier, and it allows for rapid response. But it's not all axons are myelinated. Do we want a fast response when we're moving food through our digestive tract? Do we want rapid bowel movement stimulation? I hope not, right? Everybody would be on their call late, and you'd have about 10 seconds to get down there before it'd be a mess, right? So we wouldn't want that. Do we want rapid secretion of insulin from the pancreas? So we have this wave of insulin to crash our blood sugar? No, we want little bits of insulin secretion, slow insulin secretion to slowly bring our blood sugar down after meals. So we want slow secretion of some glands and some smooth muscle. But reflexes, like if... 
something's coming at you and you quickly turn your head to avoid getting hit in the face by a ball, well, that you'd want myelinated axons being in charge of that movement, right? So it's not always ideal to have myelinated axons if you need slow responses. So glandular activity um, has some of those are unmyelinated axons. So we can have slow response, slow and gradual, like the endocrine system, right? So if we look again how the, the signal jumps, if it's myelinated, it jumps from over the myelin to the node of Ranvier. Notice there's channels at these nodes. That's how those ions can flow. And again, when we talk about electrical signals, it's all about ion flow. And we're going to really focus on that ion flow um, in detail. So if it's not myelinated, the channels are evenly distributed across the membrane, so it's much slower. Think if you were running up the steps, you heard a scream upstairs, and you wanted to get up the steps as fast as you could. Would you go up each individual step? Never, right? It'd be like maybe two or three hanging onto the handrail and getting up there, right? That's kind of what we're looking at here with myelinated axons. You're jumping over sections of myelin to get to where the channels are, and that's how the impulse travels, is jumping over, okay? So we call that saltatory conduction. On the bottom here, saltatory conduction, just think of it as jumping down the axon. It'll go a lot faster that way than going, burning down the entire axon in its entirety. <coughs> so when we look at matter, we talk about gray matter and white matter, Gray matter in the brain is made up of unmyelinated parts of the neuron. So if we look at a typical neuron that looks like this, what part is unmyelinated in this picture? What parts of the neuron are unmyelinated? Cell body and the dendrites. So when we look at gray matter in the brain and spinal cord, it's made up of cell bodies and dendrites. When we look at white matter, it's made up of axons, myelinated axon. What makes it white? The myelin. The myelin is a fatty substance, and fat looks white, correct? So myelin, our white matter is myelinated axons. Gray matter are cell bodies and dendrites. So if we have damage to white matter, we're going to have problems with conduction. If I have damage to gray matter, I'm going to have trouble just with generating an impulse and function. So if we look at the different types of neurons, they're not all like the one I showed in your picture. Most of them are what we call multipolar. So you have a cell body on one end. You have dendrites coming off the cell body, and then you have an axon. So that's typical, the multipolar neuron. A bipolar neuron, we see in the eye and ear, bipolar means the cell body's in the middle, and you have the one singular dendrite with extensions on one end, and you have an axon on the other end. So if you look at the cell body, if it's multipolar, there's many extensions off the cell body from multi, multipolar. Bipolar, there's only two extensions coming off the cell body. And unipolar, we see only one little extension coming off of the cell body. So we see this in the, in the spinal cord, in the nerves coming into the spinal cord, I should say. And we'll talk about that when we get into more detail. But just be aware that these neurons don't all look the same. And the multipolar neuron I showed here is the most common type of neuron, but they're not all um, set up or arranged in this way where the cell body's on one end, the axon, and the axon terminals are on the other. And we'll get into that. So there's other cells in nervous tissue. They're called neuroglia. Neuroglia. Think of them as nerve glue. So they help and nourish and keep our neurons intact, but they do not conduct electrical signals. So they're not actively sending signals and communicating, but they have a specific job to help neurons stay healthy. They're the nursemaids of the neurons. So they can undergo mitosis. 
so they're the small little dots in the background of nervous tissue. Do you remember looking at nervous tissue and seeing the big purple neuron with the extensions, and then you could see the nucleus? And then there are all these dots around the, around the, in the background, those dark dots. Those are the cell bodies of the neuroglia, of these supportive cells. And because they can undergo mitosis, they're the ones that cause brain tumors. And brain tumors can be cancerous or benign. Some people, you know, will have a brain tumor and it's, tumor and it's completely benign. It's not cancerous. It's not breaking off and spreading to the body. It's just a, you know, those odd growths that people have. So they undergo mitosis, the neuroglia do. So different cells have different functions. So if we look at, for example, um, astrocytes. At, this is an astrocyte in nervous tissue. So if we look at this cell here, we can see it's wrapping around a capillary. So we have capillary supplying blood to the brain. The astrocytes make sure that nothing leaks out of the capillaries that shouldn't be in brain tissue. So anything water soluble is stuck in the blood and cannot leak out into the brain tissue. It needs a special transporter. So it wraps around and insulates the blood brain uh, the blood from the brain tissue. So we call it forming the blood brain barrier because we don't want things to leak into our brain that shouldn't be there. We need to protect that brain tissue. So that's the job of astrocytes is to wrap around capillaries in brain tissue to prevent <coughs> things from leaking. Microglial cells have a different job. They are the, uh, the janitors of nervous tissue. Their job is to clean up debris, repair injured neurons. So microglial cells are kind of like a immune cell in nervous tissue. And then we have ependymal cells. Ependymal cells, their job is to secrete cerebral spinal fluid, which nourishes and bathes nervous tissue. So they are ciliated cells, and they allow the, uh, with the cilia, movement of the cilia, they allow the cerebral spinal fluid to circulate around the brain, down the middle of the spinal cord, and they nourish and support brain tissue with the cerebral spinal fluid. So that's their job. So they line the ventricles of the brain, which we'll talk about, and the central, central canal. We'll learn that in lab this week. And then the oligodendrocytes, oligodendrocyte, these are cells that myelinate neurons in the central nervous system. So make sure you underline or highlight central nervous system because oligodendrocytes myelinate in the central nervous system. Schwann cells myelinate in the peripheral nervous system. They myelate our nerves, so it's a little different. And the reason why they're called oligodendrocyte, notice here's the cell, and it's myelating more than one neuron, isn't it? So oligo means many, so it's, my, it's myelinating more than one neuron axon in the central nervous system, where Schwann cells just myelinate a section. Like I said, they're like a hot dog bun over one section of an axon in a nerve. So our nerves are myelinated by Schwann cells. Neurons, are my, our neurons in the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, are myelinated by oligodendrocytes. So again, these two are related, that they both myelinate, but they myelinate in different locations, and the way they myelinate is a little different. These do it just in sections. These guys do multiple. So when you pick up next time, we're going to talk about electrical signals, and that's the action potential. <clears throat>